My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual. Someone, with some regard, is one of the best Socceroos ever to put on a jersey. He's in the Australian Hall of Fame, none other than the great Ray Bartz. Ray, welcome. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks for the kind words. So, Ray, tell us, how did you fall in love with our great game? Well... I guess it was my destiny. If I, uh, I was born in Newcastle and went to Adamstown Public School and um, you had two choices of sport at Adamstown Public School. You played cricket in summer and soccer in winter. So there was no other option. You know, the game just developed from there. And, uh, you know, Adamstown, you know, a suburb of Newcastle is such a uh, strong mining history with the English uh, coming. And, you know, the, the, that's where the foundation of our game in this country uh, was laid with the likes of Adamstown, uh, Walls End in Newcastle, Wollongong and Ipswich up in, uh, in Queensland, of course. So when did you first gravitate to the ball? So at what age? Well, I, I was kicking a ball as long as I can remember. I had an older brother, Bob, uh, who's 10 years older than me. He passed away a few years ago and he played with Adam Stown and, um, and also Merriweather here in the Newcastle area. And uh, he, he was always, he, he was my greatest influence on my career when I was young and showed me all the basics. And, you know, we we're always kicking a ball around in the backyard or, or playing cricket in summer or whatever. And, you know, um, you know, Bob always, you know, just stress, use your left foot, use your right foot. Yeah, look control this header trap it whatever you know so um and to be honest with you it was really the only coaching i ever had when i was young it, you know it, all the basics i really owe to my brother oh that's fantastic and obviously having somebody 10 years older and emulating obviously he would have been uh, more developed than you at in terms of age-wise as you're growing up it's somebody to look up to and to emulate so um now, uh, were you were you did you always play at Adam T Adamstown Rosebuds as a junior, going through the junior ranks there? No, I, I started with Adamstown uh, Rosebuds, and I played there. I played th the youngest you could play when I started was under ten, and I played three years under ten, um, and then I played a, a couple of years under twelves. We didn't have the individual year uh, age groups in those days. Uh, so I had five years with Adam Sand Juniors and then I went to play with the neighbouring club, New Lambton South, um, where a lot of my mates were playing at the time. And Cole Curran also came uh, to the club at the same time from West Walls End. So Bunny and I played with um, together at New Lambton South for three or four years uh, in our later juniors. Uh, we played there to oh, under 16s. And while we were playing under 16s, there was a good coach in Newcastle, a Scottish guy by the name of John, John McBride, who coached the first division team here in Newcastle, Maitland. And he asked Bunny and I to go and play with Maitland. Um, we were only 15 years of age at the time, and we would, uh, we would play our junior football with New Lambton South on a Saturday and train one night a week with Maitland and play with Maitland usually on the Sunday. So we were playing first grade, on the Sunday and playing juniors on the Saturday at only 15 years of age. Oh, that is absolutely brilliant. Obviously, 15 years of age, you're still just a baby, really. But you're now playing with men, and obviously that that's obviously helping your development um, play against the bigger bodies. Well, it, it, it certainly was. And actually, the first, first grade game I played, I played against Cardiff. And one of my brother's mates, uh, Cole Moore, was playing with Cardiff. And, you know, I was always the kid around those older guys growing up. And, um, and as I ran out that day, uh, Cole said, Ray, what are you doing here? I said, I'm playing. He said, you're kidding. <laughs> and actually, I got the three points that day for best and fairest at only 15 years that, of age. And as the, a 15 year old. As 15-year-old, yeah. And I, I must admit that the, the guy that gave the points that day was a former Adamstown player by name, Alec Cameron, who was also captain of the Socceroos back in the, I think, the 20s or 30s. And I remember with the report that Alec wrote in the paper, he said, if this boy doesn't play for Australia, I'm a bad judge. So he was a pretty good judge, I think, Alec, because, uh, you know, the fruition did come true, of course. But I must admit that um, I was in trouble with Adamstown because Adamstown seniors always classed me as an Adamstown boy and it was always going to be inevitable that I would play for Adamstown. So 
there was a bit of pressure um, to go to Adamstown after our first year at Maitland and, um, and Bunny and I both uh, went to Adamstown the following year to, uh, to play with Adam, uh, play with Adamstown after the one year we had at Maitland. But it was a, it was a good grounding and, and John McBride was a terrific coach and he, he developed our game, you know, from a junior player to the senior player. So we knew what to expect. So growing up as, as a teenager, what do you think your, your best attributes were um, on the football pitch? Just the love of the game, you know. We, you know, we we couldn't get enough of it. We 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 didn't have any really distractions in in those days. You know, there's no TV, there's no mobile phones, there's no video, there was no nothing. You know, every afternoon we, you know, everybody used to just congregate at the local park and have a game. Whether you played for Adamstown or or New Lenton South or whoever, we we would always go down and kick a ball around every afternoon. And you know, and I I used to emulate. Oh well, I. I always thought I was ferric um, pushkas in those days you know <laughs> yeah. just you know the, I, I, I read the book uh, Captain of Hungary in the mid 1950s and uh, you know I was always going to be pushkas but you know not quite as good as what he was of course <laughs> yes obviously the galloping major you were, you were, you were very good but uh, that's a great uh, idol to have obviously Ferris pushkas the galloping major great left foot um, so the um, you, you head across obviously with Colin Bunny Curran to um, Adamstown Rosebuds. Um, you can say uh, probably a lifelong friends, you know, from from your teenage years now till today. I know you guys are still very close. Um, yep. How is it like to to have a friendship throughout your life and football being a central part of that connection? Well, our, our careers, you know, did run a parallel, of course. You know, from our junior days at New Lamp South to Adamstown, we both spent time at Manchester United and then to, to, you know, make the national team, which was fantastic. And, to you know, to play in all the big games and the World Cup qualifying games together, you know, when we were kids, you know, when we both come from nothing, you know, my dad was a bus driver, uh, Bunny's dad was a green keeper, you know, so we didn't have a lot of a lot of distractions with, you know, holiday, going away on holidays anywhere or anything like that. All we did was play football. So to grow up together and achieve what we did was was fantastic. And to have that mateship, you know, for, you know, 60 odd years and still going strong is is something that is very, very special. Very special. Highly, obviously, of playing with you and, and still having your mateship. So, Sorry, mate, I'm losing you there. So it's it's cheers to you both that you still have that friendship and mateship over you know the 60 plus year journey and mate continue. So you you uh, you hit, you, in, you end up uh, playing with uh, Adams Down Rosebuds in the in the first team there. Uh, so talk to me about that time. What's the quality like? Uh, at Adams Down Rosebuds uh, playing in the first team. Well, we, we we had a good, a really good young team, and um, the 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 coach at the time was uh, Brian Dakin, who uh, was a former professional with Derby County in in the UK, and uh, he he once again brought our game along, you know, to the next level as well. And and at the end of that season, Adam Sound came up with the idea that. They would send two juniors to um, to England for coaching for three months, um, and I was selected along with Doug Johns, who was the younger brother of Alan Johns, who who a former Adamstown player who played for Australia in the early 1950s, and and both were fantastic players. Alan, I used to uh, idolise when I was young and watched the Adamstown senior games, of course. And Dougie was a very skillful player, so Doug and I were were selected to go to Manchester United for three months coaching at the end of the first uh, first season. So that was a, um, a tremendous thrill. I was uh, I was currently indentured as a, an apprentice painter decorator. So I had to break my indentures to um, to go over there and uh, for three months, uh, you know, which was hard to do because, you know, it was important to get a trade in those days, but, you know, nothing was going to stand in the way of football um, to have that sort of experience, of course. So it was a, it was a great opportunity. What a great honour. I mean, you think about now players going overseas, but, you know, you're, you're you know, Newcastle's a small town, you know, hardworking people. You talk about the, 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 the people that sort of are part of that. 
that cultural community. And now you're heading across to Manchester, obviously another hardworking town, but into one of the biggest clubs in the world. So what your expectations? Tell us about the, the, the trip over. What do you remember? Well, I, we'd never been on a plane before to start with, you know, so that, that was a sort of an experience in itself. You know, the, the trip took forever because in those days, I think we, we had about 10 stops on the, um, on the flight to, um, to the UK and, of course, no entertainment on board or anything like that. Um, arrived in London, then got another flight up to Manchester and we didn't really know what to expect, you know, because the only exposure we had in those days of, the, of English football was the FA Cup, uh, was a game we saw, um, you know, just once a year, of course, and that was on at midnight, uh, as it is now, of course. So we didn't see a lot of English football and we, and we saw some highlights from time to time on the news and that. So we didn't really know what to expect. You know, we, we both thought we we're going to be playing against supermen with four arms and four legs and <laughs> whatever and that. So we were, we were a little bit intimidated, to say the least, when, when yes. we got there. And, yep. um, and then our first uh, meeting was with um, Matt Busby. And uh, we went right. into the office and he said, um, OK, now um, you boys are here. How, how long are you here for? And we said, oh, well, we believe we're here for three months. He said, well, where are you staying? We said, well, we don't know. And he said, how are you going to live? And we said, well, we don't know. <laughs> and nothing was really organised between the two clubs. He said, look, he said, we'll put you up in digs, which was, you know, boarded with a family, and we'll, we'll give you two pounds a week each. That's $4 um, a week each to live on. And we said, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. So, so we they boarded with a, a family and... Um, and then went to training in the in the morning. They they sort of uh, we went down to where the first team was training, and and we had a, a kick around with um, a coach John Aston, who was a former Manchester senior John Aston. He played in the 1940s with Manchester United, and Jack Crompton, a f- former goalkeeper, was uh, also a coach. So we, Dougie and I played two against two against those guys, so they could get a bit of an idea of what sort of skill level we had, and yep. we sort of did okay. So they um, chuffed us off the next day to train with the uh, the juniors, the A and the B team at the cliff, and um, and then we we sort of trained there uh, most days for the next uh, couple of months and that, and uh, you know which w- was fantastic till we found our feet and whatever. So, what was Busby's personality like as a man? Uh, we didn't really have a lot to do with him, to be honest with you. That 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 first meeting um, was probably one of the only times I ever had a face to face meeting with him. He never, he never came down to training or anything like that. He was always in the office. He had, you know, the coaches doing all the training and coaching and whatever. Um, with the junior, the junior setup, John Aston was predominantly the coach there. Um, and I played um, a few games in the A team. Dougie played a few games in the B team. Um, I scored a few goals. And after about Six weeks, I was selected in the second team in the reserves. Yep. Um, I couldn't believe it. I said, yeah, in the second team, you know, I'm only 17 years of age, you know, yes. um, and playing with the likes of Noel Cantwell, who was captain of Ireland at the time. Graham Moore was playing uh, for Wales. Uh, you know, uh, young John Aston was there. Brian Kidd was still in the B team, for instance. You know, Willie um, Willie Alexander went on to um, play in the first team. Uh, Jimmy Ryan played first team and was coached there for a long time. These are all guys that were in the in the second team the at the time. Yeah. So, um, and I played, you know, most of the remainder of that season in the in the reserves. So, uh, um, you know, and when I no, I must have only been. Yeah, that's right. After the three months, we went back to, to Matt Busby again and he said, OK, boys, the three months are up. He said, Ray, we'd like to offer you a contract to stay. Doug, unfortunately, there's not a, a contract on offer for you. Um, so Doug came back to Adamstown and uh, I accepted the contract and my two pound a week went to, I think it went to about 12 pound a week. Um, but I had to pay my own digs out of that. So, um and that's when I was playing regularly in the second team. So there wasn't a lot of money on offer in those days. That £12, could you survive on the £12 uh, oh, during the yeah. week? 
yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we didn't live highly, put it that way. We didn't okay. eat at any five star restaurants or <laughs> anything like that. But um, but no, no, we could, um, you know, we could have the occasional night out, and um, you know, right. um, we, we yeah, you know, we didn't sort of buy too many clothes or do too many things or anything like that. But you know, it was uh, you got to remember that this is the mid '60s, and you know, the, the things, you know, the Manchester was still showing the signs of the war in the 60s there was a lot of buildings that hadn't been repaired and um you know the weather was miserable to say the least and um it was a pretty it was a depressing place to be to be honest with you after you know growing up in australia and uh, people you know used to say what, what do you miss you know more about australia i said i miss the colors i said what do you mean colors i said the blue sky and the green grass and the yellow sand and things that we take for granted over there everything was gray and right. gloomy, yeah and miserable depressing yeah. day in and day out the, um, I suppose, and the, the, the heavy rain and the cold, you know, you, oh, you're in absolutely. God's country. You're in God's country there in Newcastle. Um, Sorry, mate. So, I missed you then. I said uh, you're, you're in God's country there in Newcastle. Oh, absolutely. There, yeah, keep the secret. So I should don't tell anybody, mate. We're getting enough people moving up here from Sydney now. <laughs> keep it a bit quieter. But but it was, a, it was a really, it was a tough existence for a kid because, you know, when I went there, I never went to make a career of it. I went there for three months coaching and for the experience and whatever. And it was a, it, it was a really tough because, um, yeah, as I said, we had, had no computers, no nothing like that. And my only, and my, my father died when I was only thirteen, so my mum was home by herself. My brother was by this stage he was travelling the world somewhere, and um, so mum was home by herself, I was in England and, and she'd never had a phone on at home either. So we had, our only communication was by letter. So it was, um, you know, and they usually took a week or two weeks t- to get, and so, you know, homesickness was really a tough thing for me when I was yep. there. And um, especially when I didn't have the burning ambition to make a, a career of it, I really missed home, I missed my mum, I missed everything like that. So to settle there and and I think I played the whole time I was there, I played um, with a lack of confidence, if you know what I mean. I, yeah. um, I was sort of intimidated by, by where I was and whatever. And every time I got the ball, I, instead of trying to sort of create an opportunity to shoot, I, I would be looking to set somebody else up. And Jimmy Murphy was um, assistant manager to Matt Busby and he used to look after the second team. And he, he, he always was saying to me, Ray, you've got a good shot. You've got to use it more. You've got to use it more. And, um, and I, I, it probably wasn't until I returned to Australia that I got a few write-ups that I started to believe in myself and started to, you know, probably shoot more and, yep. you know, be a little bit more selfish than what I was over there. Did it help? Because the second year uh, Bunny Curran got the offer um, to, to come yep. up, was, was it easier having another Aussie with you and obviously a mate? Yeah, uh, Bunny Bun come over at, um, uh, during the second season, yep. and you know initially when he got there it was really good. But Bun once again he found it very hard to settle as well, and um, he played more with um, the A team and the B team, and that I don't I can't remember Bun playing with the second team at all. But um, it, it it probably unsettled me a little bit because Bunny never settled at all over there he, he was always anxious to get home so if anything it probably unsettled me a little bit bit more as well so um you know mum's by herself you've got this burning desire to return back to your native home and so you come back um to australia and and then obviously this is where you you start playing for, yeah well when- when I first went to Matt Busby, and this was, um, I think, towards the end of the second season, and I was still playing regularly in the in the second team, and I said to him, um, uh, Mr. Busby, I'm I'm really homesick. I want to go home. And his first reaction was, but but son, nobody leaves Manchester United. <laughs> and he he said, look, I'm not going to let you go. I want you to think about it for a month. He said, you're doing really well. He said, come back and see me at the end of the month, and then we'll talk. So I went back at the end of the month and um, I walked in. He said, you haven't changed your mind, have you? I said, no. He said, okay, I wish you all the success. And so then I, I then we, I came back home. So sorry, mate, we can continue. Yeah, now. yeah got it. Yeah, so it, it, that's a really good context. Obviously, somebody who realises that you're on the precipice of, you know, the biggest 
arguably at that time one of the biggest clubs in the world. This is yeah, it was it was a bit hard to you know I never had sort of any um, sort of m well I had ambitions to play first team put it that way but I never had I was never real it was never realistic that I was yeah. going to play first team because in those days you, you didn't have the substitutes that you do now yes um, you know and the first team was pretty well much the, the first team week in and week out and it was a little bit hard to un, you know put George Best Bobby Charlton or Dennis Law out of position you know yes. so and this is a bit hard tell, I mean so <laughs> First team, put it that did way. You, did you get to go out at all with uh, George Best or um, any of the boys to, to show you around? Because they would have had a ripe old time there in Manchester. Well, yeah, I, I did. I did knock around with um, George a little bit. Not not a great girl, and we, we there was a, a ten pin bowling alley not far from Old Trafford that um, we used to hang out at a little bit. And George came down there a few times and that. And um, George was probably a year older than, than what I was. And, uh, and in those days, he never drank. You know, George was, would have only been 18 years of age then. And, uh, you know, he was just one of the boys. And, you know, even though he was playing first team and, a, you know, a, a huge star even then, he um, he, he was very quiet. And, if football. anything, very oh. shy. Yeah, so uh, he, 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 didn't, he didn't remain that way, did he? So he uh, uh, ended up being one of the most popular um, oh, icons, well, icons of the 60s and 70s in England and maybe well, even George, in the world. George, you know, they always class George as the fifth Beatle, you yes. know, because he, he, his popularity was almost equivalent to the Beatles in those early days. And he had the Beatle haircut and one thing or another, but he also had the skill to back it up. He was a fantastic player. And of course, what, what that brought was a lot of hangers on and, and a, a lot of people that sort of um, led him down the wrong path. And, you know, and coming from a very poor background, he, he just couldn't handle all the fame and adulation that came very quickly to him, you know, but, but other people that were really good to me was, um, Harry Gregg, the former goalkeeper, who was a hero of um, the Munich air disaster in 1958. Harry was goalkeeper at the time, and he went back into the, the playing time and time again and dragging people out of it. He was fantastic um, to me when I was there. And, and Bobby Charlton was, you know, I can't speak highly enough for Bobby Charlton. You know, he was he was just a gentleman and um, and the player that, you know, I, you know, I look up to more than anybody. And yeah. Uh, we used to play a lot of cricket underneath the um, in the grandstand, and you know it was always oh. What of Old Trafford? You played cricket at Old Trafford, the... yeah, in between good training track. sessions and everything. And you know I had a, a bit of a cricket background. I I played a couple of New South Wales schoolboys a couple of years, and so I could sort of play a bit. And did so you bat or bowl good. or both, Ray? Did so, you bat or bowl or both? Uh, bat. I was a batsman. Um, and uh, so we, we had a lot of test matches underneath the um, <laughs> the grandstand there, you know, especially when the Australians were touring uh, England and that, you know, and it was always good to, to smash the ball around a little bit against the, the Poms over there. But we, yes. we had a lot of fun. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. I'm sure the um, it, it's it's hard. You, you touch on you're really one of the, the first pioneers to head over and play in a really big club. Now... Yep. You know, you talk about the support networks and even just something as simple as a mobile phone, you know, having a, that, that tele, telecommunications capability now. Yeah, I, I think if, and, no, I think if I would have had the opportunity to come home at the end of the first season during the off season, you know, yeah. at the end of the, the first season, we had a, um, you know, you have a like a two month break or whatever it was. And I was stuck in Manchester and all the other boys that were there, you know, even George and um, the other guys that were from Scotland or Ireland, they were all going home and I was, I was still stuck in Manchester. So I think if I would have had the, the opportunity then to uh, come back to Australia for, you know, a few weeks and go back again, I think it would have recharged the batteries. Recharge the batteries. Yeah. Um, but, it wasn't possible because international travel in those days was expensive and it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't something I can afford and the club didn't offer it and I didn't even think about asking or anything, you know, so uh, it never happened. Got it. So um, when you when you come back, um, you move to... Um, I come back to Adamstown. Adamstown. So, yeah. and how well, long... I thought well, I, I, I thought I had an obligation to Adamstown for sending me over in the first place. 
it was at their expense. So I came back and, and played um, the, that season with Adam Stown. Um, I played for Northern New South Wales against AS Roma in Newcastle and was selected in the Australian squad from that game against okay. AS Roma, but I never never got on the park um, that day. Um, I was in the squad but never played. And then at the end of the season, I had um, a number of offers from Sydney clubs because, you know, the, the pinnacle of the game in those days was in Sydney. You, you know, you had to move to Sydney if you wanted to make a career. Of it. And Sydney was only a, you know, a couple of hours' drive from Newcastle, so it wasn't as if it was the end of the earth again. Um, and Harkoa came, Harkoa, Sydney came, um, very attractive offer. And, um, you know, so I went to Harkoa for an Australian record transfer fee at the time, which was $5,600, which um, doesn't seem a lot of money these days, but the houses in Newcastle on the beach now, which are worth three and $4 million, you could have bought a house um, for $5,600. Wow. So that, put in, that puts it in perspective what, what they paid for me in, uh, in those days. And uh, that goes to show that uh, Adamstown would have jumped at that transfer fee, obviously. And, and Well, they didn't jump at it. They, okay. uh, you know, the club, Adamstown had a licensed club in those days uh, okay. on the ground and they were quite a, a profitable club, you know, and, uh, they were they were very apprehensive to let me go, but they knew I wanted to better myself, and uh, they didn't um, they didn't stand in my way, which I'm, okay. I'm you know always grateful to them for the opportunity they gave me both then and and previous. And, um, so you ended up having a fantastic and long career at uh, Sydney um, Hakoa. Talk to me about the culture of that club. Well, you know the club in those days was a very well-run club by, you know, some very successful businessmen, of course, you know, the, you know, Frank Lowy and um, Andrew Lederer from um, Presto and Primo Smorgas, of course, and um, quite a number of other uh, directors that all had very successful businesses. So straight away, you know, I went into a, a setup that was a lot more professional, even though we weren't professional, we were only part-time players, you know, we had jobs to hold down or whatever. It was, uh, we were looked after like professionals, the training facilities and, the, and whatever. And the quality of players that I joined there at the time was, you know, Danny Walsh and Alan Marnock, Dennis Jaeger came back from, from overseas as well. Um, you know, we, we had a quality quality team. And then at the end of the, the first season, uh, John Wokas joined us from, from mm. Arpia. Um, and in 1968, we, um, the year after I joined, we, we went through undefeated and everything, Australia Cup, Sydney. And so we had a quality team playing good football in those days. And it was very enjoyable, I must admit. The, um, yeah, so... It, Winning uh, papers over a lot of problems, right? So, and, and, and all throughout those years, Sydney Karkoa always had the quality on the park to give you the opportunity to win probably your fair share of games. So talk to me about the service. Did you always gravitate towards the, 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 the forward part of the pitch, um, given the fact that, you know, you were commenting on early other people noting the quality of your shot, what are the, some of the aspects of the other? You also had, a, I think, a fantastic engine. You could run quite quite a bit and, and very talented on the ball. Um, did you find that that's where you wanted to be? You wanted to be there uh, contributing to try and contribute to for goals scored? Yeah, of course. Well, when I was growing up, I played more like wing, uh, wing back or midfield as it is now. And uh, it was only when I was in uh, at Manchester United that I scored a, a few goals from um, uh, midfield playing in the A team that they sort of moved me to more of a striker. Um, I did play a few games in the, the second team as midfield. When, and I must admit, I did prefer playing in midfield than playing up front. And I think my more natural game was not so much to be the target man up front, but to play off a, a target man, if you know what I mean. And, yep. you know, 
a number of players that I played with over the years, like David Ke- uh, Dave Keddy at, at Tarkoa and um, Adrian Olsen, of course, with the national team, they would always play that target man role. And I would play a role that hadn't been invented in those days, and it's now called the number 10. Yeah. Uh, and you, you play that sort of attacking midfielder at the at the point of the midfield. And it, it, was, a, it was a role that I sort of played more naturally. It came to me more naturally than, than, than something that was created. And so I would be, um, I'd be up and down in midfield, but when we were attacking, I was always in there behind the, the front line and any opportunities that came from 20 or 30 yards out, I was more than happy to, to have, have a great, yeah. to have a go. Because, you know, um, I was more, I was very comfortable with either foot with right or left. And a lot of people think I was a natural left footer, but I was, I was a natural right footer, but I probably scored as many goals with my left as what I did with my right. And that all comes back to the coaching that my brother gave me when I was very young. That, that's brilliant because so many, so many players are one-sided and, and yeah. We, we talk about coaching young kids to, to balance themselves out, just to give some sort of proficiency, but really the, the most talented players, you don't know which way they're going to turn or which way they're going to play. And if you've got equal strength on both sides of your body, it really creates confusion because you can move either way and play either way. So Absolutely. But not only that, you, you know, when you're playing and especially a, a, in a, a, a international you know, you haven't got time to pull the ball down with one foot and get it onto your other foot and hit it. You know, you, you've got to hit it whichever, whichever foot it lands on, you know. So it's, um, it's very um, important to be comfortable with, with that. And you, you're talking about at club level, that 68 year. Do you, do you think that that was the best year at uh, Hakoa that you had there? So you're a couple of seasons in, um, you, you, you guys... Are, I think you, you just said that you won the cup that year and and the, and the league. Um, the was that you think that the best oh yeah that 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 was obviously the you know the, the our most outstanding year you know the the first year nineteen sixty seven we didn't do all that well I um, you know I, um, I I did get picked to play for Australia that first year nineteen sixty seven against Scotland um, I was uh, just turned twenty um, so I played. Um, the two games against Scotland then was injured in the second game in, in Adelaide and um, you know that and then of course we went to Vietnam at the end of um, 1967 with the national team um, with Johnny uh, Johnny Warren as, ca- as many, uh, sorry as captain yes. for the first time and we won that tournament in uh, in Saigon, which is the first time a national team has ever won anything, especially overseas. So that really laid the foundation for the um, for the the future of the Socceroos, I think, at, at national level. But but coming back to club level again, you know, the you know with with John Walkers coming to the uh, club in 1968, it really gave us a really strong team, especially paired with Alan Marnock. Um, uh, the late Alan Marnock, who just passed away, unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago. Um, at the back with Alan and John playing centre-back, we had a very solid um, back four with Dennis Shager there. Um, and then in midfield, Danny Walsh, uh, myself, uh, and up front, Dave Keddy and Keith Jones. It was a really quality team. You know, it was a team that was probably as good as any uh, team I've seen in Australia at club level. Talk to me about that 67 tour of Vietnam. So what a crazy time, you know. You've got you've got Aussie board, Aussie boys that are later to be um, sent in there, and you guys are in there playing a football game. So the uh, talk to me about um, just the the tension um, in Saigon at the time. Obviously, the, the Americans would have had control in 67 there, but there would have been rumblings. Um, and were you told to stay away from the American soldiers um, and not, uh, and were you okay as being Aussies, uh, Aussie sporting team playing football there? Well, it was, um, you know, a lot of, you talk about some of the young Australians were, were over there fighting and that we, you know, when we were all, I think 19 or 20, we went into a ballot to see whether you conscripted or not to, and if you were conscripted, um, you know, the chances were that you, you would go to Vietnam to fight. For, and, you know, a lot of our mates were over there 
fighting. I missed out on the ballot, thankfully. And um, so to go over there with the national team was, we we didn't really know what to expect, you know, um, when we, we, we sort of landed in Saigon and, you know, we saw the might of the American Air Force at um, Saigon Airport and that, and then we realised that, hey, you know, hey, there's something a bit serious going on here. Mm. Um, and then we got the uh, police escort to our hotel um, through all the streets. The hotel was very basic, no air conditioning, of course. The food was horrific. You couldn't eat the food and couldn't drink the water. Um, lizards crawling around our rooms everywhere. Stan Ackley turned the fan on and got an electric shock was straight across the room. <laughs> so it was it was pretty basic conditions that we were living in. And then, um, you know, to go to training, it was sort of the monsoon season. The, the, the training field was like a cow paddock and heavy and with mud and whatever and that. And, you know, very hot and very humid. And, of course, not eating or drinking well. It, it was very draining physically and, and yeah. mentally, you know. But, but from a security point of view, we were never never thought we were in in danger in any way we were obviously told not to mix with any of the americans or venture too far from the hotel or you know the security all around the hotel and that of course and then when we we'd go to a game once again we'd have the police escort to the game we'd get there and there'd be uh, vietnamese soldiers going around the stadium with mine detectors to make sure there was no nothing planted uh, or whatever so it was um a very uh, not the best build up for an international game by any means as you can yeah. imagine but yeah. um, and then at night you know we, we could stand on the roof of the hotel and you could see you know all the mortars and bombs going off in the distance and everything so there, there was nothing happening around us but it, it wasn't too far away so it was um, you know Sort of surreal. Unreal. Would you would you would you describe the the experience as a surreal experience? A little bit unusual. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, it was you know. Well, we'd never been to Asia before, and most of the boys, and we didn't really know what to expect. So the culture and and everything was you know Different. quite foreign to us as it was. Let alone with the uneasiness of the the tension of the war and so forth. And, and it wasn't until, you know, we, as I said, not being able to eat the food for a few days, the Australian Army eventually come in and said, is there anything they can do to help? And the management organised for us to go to the Australian headquarters in Saigon um, every so often to have a meal and that, which was fantastic. And, you know, we get the, um, the bus with the police escort again downtown and we get to the Australian headquarters in Saigon and, out, and it was just like a three-story building or something like that from memory yeah. and out at the front they had a bunker with um the australian boys on machine guns and whatever out the front uh, guarding it and we'd go inside and we'd have a game of, you know pool or and have something to eat and it was nice to be there but occasionally you'd hear a shot go off and and what that was it was a warning shot from the boys out the front that if a, a vehicle parked too close to the um the, you know the um, premises they, they'd fire a warning shot and then if it didn't move they'd fire another one and the, each shot was getting closer to the the vehicle you know so that, yeah. that was unnerving when when that was going on but uh, but anyway we you know they, we, we, we made a joke of it more than anything and of course we won that tournament against um you know the New Zealand, Malaysia, Indonesia there was quite a few teams there but yeah. the final was played against um South Korea Yep. which the first time we'd encountered South Korea and um, and they they were an awesome team and, you know, virtually thought they were unbeatable in that tournament. And for us to win the final against them w was a tremendous um, effort from, from our guys and a tremendous thrill to do that. Um, so, as I said, I think the team spirit and camaraderie that we established under those conditions laid the foundation for the team spirit of the soccer is for many years to come. That, that tournament, you scored a few goals as well from memory as, as well. I think you scored a goal against in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia. And, uh, New Zealand, I think you got a goal against New Zealand that tournament as well um, from memory. So, um, yeah, you also contributed to our success. So, uh, great Great tour, obviously, in trying circumstances. Um, yep. 
I might I must have one one other little factor on, on that tour, Sasha, was the day after we we weren't due to leave for another another day. So we had a lay day after the the tournament and the um, the army uh, or, and the Australian Air Force Army altogether asked if if we would be willing to go if they put a plane on go down to Vung Tau, where the, the was the main base for the Australian boys at the time and just play a, a, a bit of a game against the locals down the local fellows down there so we said yeah by all means so you know we sort of celebrated a bit that night and you know not feeling too good the next day we we got out to the airport and there's a caribou waiting for us you know the troop carrier and um we all line up along get inside line up alongside the side of the caribou you know like the troops do and um with the back of the the back door, you go in through the back of the caribou in there, and um, and then the plane taxiing to take off, and the back of the, the caribou is still open. And we say that hey, they haven't shut the back door. And they said, no, don't worry about it, you'll be right. So they flew all the way over the jungles, um, over the Viet Cong, whoever, uh, down to Vung Tau with the, the back of the caribou open. And then when we got down to Vung Tau, the pilot said, would you guys like to see the beach? So he's going down, buzzing the beach over low over the where all the troops were staying. And then we, we sort of landed there and we're, we're very glad to get off that plane, let me tell you. And <laughs> the boys that, that didn't play the, the previous day in the final, they all played a, an exhibition game against the troops down there. And it was a fantastic, a fantastic day to go down there and to support you know, the, the guys that were in the thick of it, you know, it was yeah. um, horrific. A bit of a morale boost for him, I suppose. Yeah, and I'm, I must admit that Johnny Warren, uh, f- when he was alive, fought for many years to get a service medal for the players that went over there because all the entertainers that went all got a service medal um, in appreciation of entertaining the troops. And I don't think any of them would have entertained the troops any better than what we did that yeah, one great. particular day. A great little morale boost. They're, they're the things that distract your mind, you know what I mean? Like uh, any way yeah. to, to get that sort of small respite of distraction. Um, yeah, absolutely. In, uh, in 68, uh, for the Socceroos, you had a, a, a few games against Japan. Um, talk to me about that Japanese side because they were, yeah. they were quite formidable. They were. They, they, they'd won the bronze medal at the, um, at the Olympics. Um, that year, I think it was, and um, so they were they were a quality team, and they had a number of good players, and uh, you know that they had a German coach at the time as well. So they were they were a very skillful team, and you know played very similar to what the Japanese do, players play these days. You know, and um, very fast, very skillful, and so they, they were tough games, but they were they were good games for us to know where we actually were against the quality of that. And, of course, you know, we then encountered Japan and South Korea in the qualifying games for the 1970 World Cup the year after that. So, so that, 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 that was a good foundation for what, what was around the corner. So, you know, you, you're now being coached by a couple... We're going through transitions of different coaches coaching the, the national team. So you had... Um, Vengloss and, and uh, well, we, we had Joe Vengloss against um, Scotland only the three game. Then Joe Vlasic took over after that, Uncle Joe. Um, he took over on the, the Vietnamese tour in end of nineteen sixty seven and was coach uh, right through the World Cup qualifying um, nineteen sixty nine um, until Rally uh, took over in nineteen seventy. So uh, talk to me. Uh, so you know, before before Rally took over, you, you played a couple of games against Greece. I think you got yep. a goal in one of those games uh, against the Greek the Greece side. So you know, the opposition's steep. It's not like you guys are. You know, every time you play, that you, you, you're playing against decent opposition, and you're, yep. you're putting in a, a good show. The, the team, from from memory, is, is starting to settle. There's not too many players coming in and out of the side, but you've got a core group of players that are sort of occupying the majority of the spots, um, yeah. yourself being one of them. What was the camaraderie within the boys? Well, well, we had a lot of stability in the team. 
in, in those days, the team didn't change a great deal unless it was injury or... Injury or, or, or work commitments. That, that's the other problem, right? Well, so. that, it's about to say that. You've got to remember that we're, we're playing against a lot of teams in those days that were full professional as they are now. And we were still part-time players. You know, we were, you know, we were all holding down a, a five-day-a-week job. You know, my... my you know, routine of a day usually would be I, I was working for Andrew Ledra at the time at Presto Small Goods as a, a sales rep. I would I would leave home at 7.30 in the morning, um, then work and then go straight from there to training at Wentworth Park with Hakoa um, and get home at 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. Um, and that was three or four days a week. And that was um, – and then we are expected to, try, uh, to play, you know, an international – you know, at the weekend or or whatever, and obviously a lot of them, a lot of times we'd have a few days in camp before an international, so that would give you the opportunity to to sort of um, blend a little bit more, and yeah. But the team spirit, as soon as you got into into camp, that it was like you know we were there yesterday. We were all mates, and yeah. everybody knew the way everybody played, and you know we've been through some tough overseas tours and whatever. So the camaraderie and the mateship was was just incredible. You know, I remember one tour we went with. Um, I think it was with with Rally. We went to. Um, I think we went to Viet- uh, No, we went to South Korea, and there was martial law declared there. Then we went to the Philippines, there was martial law declared there. And, really? You know, so it, you know, the, you come back and everyone says, "Oh, I bet you had a good time while you were touring around Asia." <laughs> All we saw was, was that. that tour, was that the tour where he, he took you like within two months? You like him played like thirteen games. Uh... No, I didn't go on that tour. Okay. That that was the first tour that Rally took the team overseas on um that was 1970 after 1969 you know yep. we, we i'd had three months off work um with qualifying games and international games because we the the 1969 campaign we we played games in um uh, we played a tournament in south korea and okay. we beat korea and japan in that tournament that would have been sufficient more than sufficient by today's standard to qualify for the 1970 world cup um we then didn't know what our next um game would be and in those days rhodesia which uh was sort of outlawed by um you know united nations for racism and whatever uh, nobody wanted to play them so they, they decided our next game was going to be against rhodesia and um, you know, we couldn't go into Rhodesia because of them being blacklisted. So the, the games were played in Mozambique. So we had to fly to Mozambique and play games against Rhodesia, which was a pretty tough task. They weren't a bad team. And we we, we ended up beating them after the third game. And then um, we had to play Israel in Tel Aviv yes. and at home. But to get from Mozambique to Israel the Arab countries wouldn't let us fly over the Arab countries. So we had to fly all around. I think we flew to Lisbon in Portugal, then down to Athens and then back to Tel Aviv and play the next day. Um, We lost that game 1-0 and then the return game was in Sydney and then it was a one-all draw in Sydney. So we missed out on qualifying that time by the odd goal. But the travel and and everything we went through was incredible. And I don't think... Uh, just got married that um, that 1969. So um, when Rally came in and it was going to be the tour, you know, around the world for a couple of months, I, I and I just couldn't take the time off work and be away from the family. And a few boys were in the same same position. So a lot of um, new players got the opportunity on that tour um, to establish themselves, like uh, Jimmy McCoy. Um, Peter Wilson, for instance, um, you know, they established themselves on that tour um, through the opportunity of some of the more um, players that have been there over the last few years not being available. Yeah, so the um, that, that's the thing. The uh, football is now a lot different in this modern day, oh. you know, full time. Imagine That'd if be- you somebody like of your quality could could play today and what could be accomplished, you know, uh, training twice a well, day, well, and nutrition and all that type of stuff. You'd really be able well, to tell I, I that. think you know, uh, good players from any era would be good players in today's 
yeah. they'd be better players, you know, yeah. because of the, the the grounds they play on, the, the training facilities, the equipment, you know, you, you can't compare. But you know players that have got skill and you look at players like Adia Bonnie, for instance, you know, Adia would be an outstanding player in, in today's on the better grounds and the better conditions. And, and, and that, you know, Jimmy Mackay, for instance, Bunny, Bunny Cohen, Bunny's the, you know the best overlapping. He was overlapping fullback before overlapping fullbacks were even invented. Yeah. You know, and some of the balls that he used to put in the box from a striker's point of view, you know, that you just couldn't ask for anything better. Even the weight of the ball, some of the balls that you played on, it would have been like rocks. Like now, yeah. you, like you, like you kick a ball today, and they're so light and fluffy, yeah. uh, and you ping them, they go forever. You guys were cracking like, you know. Maybe they weren't as heavy as bowling balls, but they're pretty pretty heavy balls, especially once they get waterlogged. Well, um, they did they did improve over the years. I must admit, when I when I yeah. first started, they're all made of leather and yeah. you know with laces in them and everything. And yeah. you're going to make on on the um, the day uh, the wet days, the, the leather absorbs water and they become heavy and waterlogged. Yeah. And yeah. you know, so you know the, the, the those balls were quite hard to hit. But as they got you know, the syntheticness uh, composition of the balls became, a, you know, some of the balls were fantastic, you know, yeah, but okay. nowhere near as good as what they are now. You know, they, you know, they, they'd be a dream to be able to strike one of those balls. The, um, so talk to me about um, now your, your back in the side. So you, you guys, uh, you guys ended up playing the English FA as well. And then a couple of games against Israel in uh, 71, I think uh Talk to me about that tour, first the English FA uh, tour, some of the players that you would have played against in that in those games. Well, that, that, you know, the, any any English team, you know, in those days was always hard. You know, a number of English teams t- toured, you know, Wolves when they were, you know, a quality team and then some Scottish teams and so forth. But the English team were, were uh, weren't, it was an English um, FA team. FA team, uh, yeah you know, the full national team, but it was players that were on the fringe of the, the national team. And, and you know, they were obviously out to prove that they should be in the national team. So so that, they, they were there to mean business. But there was, you know, and I, I, I just can't remember some of the individuals that, that were in that team, but I know they were all regular Premier League quality players that, mm. you know, that, that, that made life quite difficult for us, you know. So we, we didn't manage to, to win... Uh, any of those games, but we were pretty close and, you know, all the way through, you know, so once again, who good you, foundation. Who, who did you room with? Uh, was it always Bunny Curran or did you get to change it up a bit? No, well, in the early days, I uh, uh, when Ronnie Corey was in the team, I, uh, Ronnie Corey and I always um, uh, roomed together. Um, Ronnie uh, was the goalkeeper, of course, in the, uh, the Vietnam Tour and then in the qualifying for the 1970 tour after that and then we used to just mix it up a little bit uh, okay uh, all right good and so the um talk to me about rally's coaching methods because we uh we often hear about it was um oh, probably his greatest skill was the uh the art of making you feel that you're better than what you were or the psychology of the of of football he was big on man management and, and pumping his team up um yep. What were your memories of his coaching style? Well, Rally was quite a contrast after Uncle Joe Vlasic. Uncle Joe Vlasic was um, Hungarian-born and built his um, a lot of his coaching methods on team spirit. You know, when he came in, he, he had a lot of success in uh, developing a lot of the Canterbury juniors at the time, like Johnny Warren and Johnny Watkins and Brian Smith. A, a lot of those guys... Uh, came through the Canterbury system when when Joe was there and um, and his coaching was more on basics and team spirit and harmony with the team and and fighting together as a unit and so forth and then when but we all knew what job we had to do where we we're playing and what was expected of and so forth but when Rally came in Rally took it to another level he took he he, he took a, a team that was you know, having a lot of success and uh, on mateship and and that to a team that was a, a professional team and 
your you, you knew exactly what your role was. You knew who you were playing against. You knew what the quality of your opponent was, and and whatever. So yeah, you know, and obviously you once you left the, that team talk, you you knew that you were the best man for that job, and you weren't going to let him down. You know, so yeah. it was um, it was a whole different era, if you know what I mean. It's just hard to explain. And he, he was big on the team uh, the team meeting, wasn't it? So he knew if it was a oh. The, more, the bigger the team meeting, the more important the game, the more detailed the instructions, obviously, of uh, what was expected. Oh, the, the, the meetings did drag on a bit. <laughs> no rally. <laughs> um, but they um, but they were always interesting. And, and, you know, by the time you go through everybody's role and, and then, of course, the mateship and how important it was to get a result and whatever. And I'll never forget that, the first time, you know, Rally brought in a, a, a psychologist into the camp. Yeah. You know, like yeah. a psychologist was never heard of in in a, any sport in those days. And and this was um, prior. This would have been about nineteen seventy two for the uh, seventy three. Not seventy two. Well, anyway, ran about there yeah. when we were qualifying yeah. for the seventy four World Cup, and it was in Sydney. And we had to play Iran. In Sydney, and then go to Tehran before. I think that was 73. 73? 73. 73. Yeah. So, yeah. so we had Tehran in Sydney. And um, so we had to get a result in Sydney, obviously. So we got the psychologist there and he, and he said, Right, any of you guys play golf? I said, Yeah, I play golf. He said, Right, just imagine you're, you know, 30 yards from the green and there's a bunker between you and the green. And you say to yourself, I'm going to hit it into that bunker. What do you do? You hit it in the bunker. That's for, you know. So he, he said, "I want you to go there and be positive. You know, forget about the bunkers. You're gonna if you're gonna shoot, say I'm gonna score. I'm not gonna have a gun. Hope I score." So we had us all in a positive mind. So he said, "Righto, now you're gonna play Iran in Sydney. Um, so we need to win. Is one nil gonna be enough? Oh no, that, that's a bit a bit tight to go two. Oh, two's a bit skinny. Three, yeah, three nil would be great. So we go out there that day. What happened? We win three nil, and oh, good you know, we said, "Oh, this place fantastic!" You know. <laughs> so anyway, we we go to Tehran, and of course, budget measures what they were in those days. The the psychologist didn't go with us to Tehran, and we arrive at. Uh, at uh, Tehran Airport about two o'clock in the morning. There's about 20,000 people waiting for us, ready to kill us. Because <laughs> they beat us. We beat them, you know, their team 3 0 in, in Sydney. And of course, everywhere we go, everyone's holding up four fingers. They're, they're going to beat us by four when the game yeah. comes. So we yeah. get to the stadium and there's 100,000 fanatics. And this is and just before, this is just before the revolution yes. in. Um, you know, when the Shah was deposed in Iran. So you can imagine it was like, you know, being on a knife edge there with the tension and so forth. Um, being intimidating, 100,000 screaming Iranians. Oh, all male as well. You all know, male, yes. Yeah, so all been, male. You wouldn't have yeah. been able to hear each other on the pitch. Oh, you it couldn't. would have been that so loud. The tension was incredible. Yeah. You know, in the first five minutes, their, their captain scored a cracker from about 25 yards out. So it's 3-1 on aggregate. And then um, Bunny brought down a guy just inside the box, and it, it was a fair tackle. But the, the referee was under as much pressure as us, and he gave a penalty. Yeah. There's never a penalty in a million years. So then, of course, they score. So it's 3 2. This is after 10 minutes. So, and then we all look at each other and we say, Rally, where the bloody hell's a psychologist? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we 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 managed to um, regain our composure and um, yeah. you know con virtually control the game from then on. And they never really looked like scoring again after that. So we ended up going through three two on on aggregate. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, but we we're glad to get out of there. Let me tell you. <laughs> when, I want uh, to talk I about a game that you played. I think earlier on in that year against the Bulgarians, they were dirty. How yeah. dirty was that game? Like yeah. Right now, if that game was played today, there'd yep. be, I, I think the game would be abandoned on the basis of not having enough men on the pitch because yep. of the amount of red cards that we've given. But back in those days, you had to, you know, for a bloke to go down, he, he almost had to be broken. But yep. that was a quite a feisty game. Talk to me about that, that tussle, uh, the Australians against the Bulgarians, because you played a couple of games and they were, they, they were oh, tough. That Vicious, yeah. They uh, so you got to remember that in those days, a lot of the teams that came here 
didn't know a lot about Australian football and yeah. they thought they were coming out here for a holiday and it was, you know, they were going to sort of lay her eyes and, you know, have, have a bit, bit of a cakewalk. And, you know, when, when we sort of, you know, played the way we were capable of playing, we could match any, any team. And, you know, the more frustrated they became, the, the dirtier they became. And, yeah. the, and the Bulgarians were, were one of the, um, typical examples that they would take a lot of their frustration out in their tackles and that and you know um but you know our team was capable of uh, of not only taking that but sort of dishing it out fairly as well and yep. hard you know we had players like ray richards and uh, yeah. manfred tough Schaefer, nails. yeah but, you manfred, know manfred tough as nails you wouldn't want oh. manfred to kick you oh boy that would hurt Oh, absolutely. You know, and, you know, but not, not unfairly, you know, yeah. they, they, they would, you know, hit a player hard where the other players would, you know, the other teams would obviously be, you know, a little bit un, unfair. Yeah. So, okay. The, um, the talk to me about um, that uh, after, after Iran, Iran uh, so Sydney against uh, Iran and then you you're off to Tehran in the, with the screaming, 100,000 screaming Iranians. You've got games yeah. against um, South Korea again. Um, That's right. Yeah. yeah. And um, for, for, the, for the qualification, and, and that, they were some fantastic games. Um, talk to me about that build up and that tension um, against the Koreans. Well, you know, we, we, we'd always had that rivalry with Korea mm -hmm. right from 1967, you know, from the Vietnam tour in the, the qualifying games in, uh, in Korea in 1969. And then, you know, then, of course, we've got them again in 1973, which, you know, the winner of, of that, those games will go through to, um, you know, to Germany for the 1974 World Cup. So our first... Um, our first game was uh, was in Sydney, and um, and I th I must admit we were all a bit flat that day. You know, it, you you get you know some games where the expectation and the tension becomes a bit too much, and the, mm. the harder you try, the worse it gets. If you know what I mean? Yeah, and, you're not playing free. Yeah, yeah, we we just didn't relax and play as well as what we, what we were capable of. But we we had a nil or draw in in Sydney, and that was you know not the result that we really wanted to go um, to Seoul, of course, you know, so then, and, but I think by this stage, it's, a, it's about November or something from memory. And when we, you know, it's quite hot in Sydney. And then when we go to Seoul, it's, it's sleeting and almost snowing and, it, you know, it's really cold. Yeah. So we're training in these sort of conditions and that, and then the, we get to the game. And of course, once again, they've got fanatical support and, very organised cheerleading and so forth. You know, a lot of tension, and you know, it, um, we're down two nil before. You know, I think about about half time. Yes, and then um, uh, Oddy, I think it was Oddy, scored um, just after half time, and then then I scored, which made it two all. Yes, and um, and then we. That game finished. Oh, we had yes. another couple of opportunities, and I think uh, yes. hit the post and a couple yes. of other things. We could have ended up winning that game, but the, yes. once again, the longer the game went, the more the stronger we we became in it. But yeah, but if the away goal rule would have applied, then yeah, you would have been now, off. Yeah, we would we would have automatically gone through, and um, you know, I would have scored the goal that got us to Germany. I, I would have got all the acclaim that Jimmy Mackay got for the goal he scored. Okay, yeah, but this is the beautiful it couldn't thing. couldn't have happened to a nicer bloke. Anyway, so okay. the late, great Jimmy Mackay. So then, you know, there was it was decided that there was going to be a third game. Third game, yeah. Was that in Hong Kong? You guys are Yeah, the third game in, was to be yeah. played in a neutral country and yeah. it was Hong Kong was yeah. sort of the closest. So um, the next day we were at the airport and the Korean team were on the same flight. Right, they were on the same flight, that's right. Same same flight and we're all laughing and joking and you and know cause, miserable because mentally we we won that game even though wow. it was a two or mentally we won that game and they were depressed and down and dejected yeah. and whatever because they they'd expected to qualify in front of their home crowd and everything so it was a real psychological advantage to be on that same flight yeah. as what they were to hong kong and and of course they the game in hong kong uh we we won one nil with the great goal from jimmy oh, what and, a goal uh, yeah, that, you know, that would probably, in my opinion, yeah, sorry, probably the best goal 
ever scored by a Socceroo to get us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that was a screamer. That that goal that is that like goal. Yeah, yeah, absolute screamer of goal. It was. It was, and it was set up well. You know, a free kick yeah. from Ray Riches to Jimmy Rooney laid it off for his good mate uh, Jimmy Mackay, and Jimmy hit it with his right foot with Jimmy was a natural left footed player. And once again, we come back to the importance of being able to strike a ball comfortably with either foot, you know, and, um, you know, we even though we only won that game one nil. It was a game we never even looked like losing, you know, we probably dominated the whole game and, you know, three or four would have been a true indication of, of, of the game. So this is the thing what people don't realize you're now in the top 60, you're already the champions of uh, of our region, as well as Asia now. And there's 16. You're now in one of 16. So w- when the last time, I mean, the, 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 it took many years for us to go back and, and make, make it out of the group stage, that's what the World Cup is like now. But back then, 16 teams, it's a, it's a smaller pool. You're definitely in the top echelon of countries in the world stage so fantastic achievement you've you've um you're now uh qualified to 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 be there um talk to me about what's it like now you by this time you've already represented australia you know more than 40 times uh what's it like standing up and hearing the national anthem being played when you when you're in the first 11 and you're on the pitch well in those days, they used to play God Save the Queen. Save the Queen, yeah. And it, it never really, you know, it, it, it's nothing like Australia Advance, Advance Australia Affair, put it that way. You know, it's, uh, to play there, and to be on the park and have Australia, Advance Australia Affair playing, I think would have made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But it was, it was just a, a procedure that you had to go through to have um, God Save the Queen played. You know, mm. it, it didn't motivate you in any way, shape, or form. But but what did motivate me when I put the shirt on and you run out onto the park and you know that, that there was so much pride in that. Mm. You know, more more so than anything. When did it change in seventy four? Is it changed in seventy four? The for the oh, it, it, it changed after I stopped. You know, I, okay. I finished playing in seventy three, of course, and. I know you're going to talk about the Uruguay games, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so um, but you know, um, but it, 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 it didn't. I, I don't think it came in until Gough Whitlam came in a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Um, so the um, all right. So the uh, the you talk you 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 brought it up. Um, obviously the the uh, Europe integral. To, yeah, you're integral to our uh, our Australian exports and and rally. On the on the on our on our interview said losing uh, Ray Bartz would have been like West Germany losing Franz Beckenbauer. That's how important um, you were to um, the Aussie team, and he was absolutely devastated uh, when obviously the doctor ruled you out after you know you know you made a decision not not to continue on after that. Slap at the time that he that, that the 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 guy gave you that whack. Did you feel like okay, this is bad? Um, I I'm I'm worried. Or talk to me through the thought process of that that situation that ended up stopping your your, your, your football. Um, well, first of all, it's very flattening for Rally to say that, but you got to you got to remember that we're a team and. You know the, the the major contributing factor of that team qualifying for the 1974 World Cup was that we were a team. We, you know right. we we played as a unit and everybody would fight for one another and everybody had a job to do. And um, if somebody was out injured, someone would slot in and and you know so whether it was me or whether it was who, I don't think it mattered. But um, it was disappointing for me not to to get to Germany after being with the team for so many years. Um, mm. You know, we'd already qualified, and, and of course, we we played these um, two warm up games against Uruguay. Uh, mm. The first one in Melbourne in um, April of '73, and you got to remember that Uruguay, um, from memory, were a semi finalist in the previous World Cup. Yeah, they they were a you know, 
a quality a quality team that was they didn't just send a team to Australia they sent their best team as a warm up for you know preparation for the 74 World Cup so that they were here um, you know for for a purpose and um, and once again I think they came with the same attitude as as Bulgaria that you spoke about before didn't know a great deal about Australian football and thought they would come here and you know um, just lay your eyes and push the ball around and, you know, try a few things and whatever. And, of course, it, it didn't work out that way. The first game in Melbourne was um, was nil-nil. And the longer the game went, the more frustrated they became and the, the, the dirtier the tackles uh, became. Um, the second game was played in Sydney and that same attitude was carried through to the game in Sydney. Um, and so it was, it was quite a... A, a tough and vicious game. Um, just before half time, I, I was playing that number ten role um, again, which hadn't been invented, by the way. Yeah. And um, I picked up a ball just outside um, uh, our penalty box and and played it forward. And I was running uh, to follow the play, and one of their players was running alongside me. And as I'm running. A, Alongside, instead of putting his arm out across my chest to stop me running past him, he threw it like a, a karate chop and hit yeah. me across the throat. And I, I didn't see it coming. In and I went, I was choked. I went down and um, had a bit of treatment and um, whatever. And then you know, just after that, it was half time and uh, went in at half time. And um, Dr. Brian Corrigan was our medical at the time. Um, and I said, oh, I don't feel too good. Um, doc, he said, yeah, Barty, have a couple of Aspro. You'll be right. Um, so I <laughs> had a couple of Aspro. I went back, played the second half, had no um, effects at this stage. Um, I managed to score one from just outside yes. the box. Yeah. And uh, so we're leading 1-0. Um, and then I picked up another ball just outside our box and sent Peter Ollerton on his way. And Peter scored. So we're leading 2-0 against Uruguay, um, a top four team in the world, um, just prior to the World Cup, remember. And um, and then later in the game, the ball went out um, for a corner for them. And with the scuffle um, in our penalty box, one of their guys punched me on the chin and knocked me to the ground. And while I, this is late in the game, and while I'm on the ground, um, our fellow said, stay down, Ray. This guy's going to get sent off. And while I'm laying on the ground, their players gathered around the fellow that hit me and one of them smacked him on the mouth and made his mouth bleed. So that when the referee came over, he said, oh, Australian number eight, he hit our guy first. And the, Donald Campbell was the referee and Donald said, no, I saw exactly what happened and sent the fellow off. And um, a lot of um, conjecture that, the injury that I received that day was from that first blow, but it was actually from the blow in the first half. And after the game, um, uh, after the game, by the way, I met the great Reg Date for the first time. Oh, Reg yeah. uh, from Newcastle. I, I never had the opportunity to meet him, but I, I was very excited and thrilled, even though I was playing for Australia in the peak of my career. You know, I, I knew so much about Reg Date that I'd never seen him play the great goal, goal scoring machine. And I met him at the Sydney Cricket Ground that day, which was fantastic. Um, and it wasn't long after that I said to my wife, I don't feel too good. I think we better go home. And went home and she was pregnant with our second child at the time and um, went home, went to bed, woke up that night and I couldn't move my left arm and my left leg. And what had happened when he hit me across the throat, he hit me right on the carotid artery. Yeah. And the blow was a similar blow to what Philip Hughes, the cricketer, received. The difference being my artery swelled and reduced the flow of blood to the brain. Uh, um, Philip Hughes's uh, artery swelled and burst. Yeah. And I was rushed to hospital the next morning and it was very close to that same situation as Philip Hughes's yeah. um, but uh, they put me in and had an angiogram and thankfully from the angiogram I hemorrhaged twice through the they had to do it through the groin which yeah. relieved a lot of the pressure yeah. and um, 
and the paralysis gradually uh, came back and um, ended up in hospital for two weeks. And as you said, um, I never played after that, but it wasn't my decision. It was um, the, the medical staff said, Ray, you're a very lucky boy. Yep. We don't know how badly damaged the artery is. The slightest blow could be fatal. So we're advising you not to play again. And so, so that was it. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing, you know, playing for Australia back in those days, you know, you, 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 you're not, you're playing for, you know, for the honour. Oh, you're playing for you know, the honour. Yeah, you're, you're playing, playing for the honour. There's no money in it. Um, no, no. There's no prize money, you know. You no, very the little... never came, no, the money never came. No, no money ever came into it or anything, yeah. you know. It was, uh, you know, you had your, I had a family, <laughs> you know, you, yeah. have, you have your whole life to think about, you know. So. Yes. It, it, you know, it wasn't a decision that you take lightly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm out of hospital after two weeks. The team by this stage is um, ready to depart on a, a, a tour before they go to Germany. And yeah. um, so the, there's a lot of pressure from F Football Australia or Soccer Australia at the time for me to go to Germany and meet up with the team over there and um, they they eventually relented and uh, after I recovered sufficiently I went with um, uh, you know the officials to meet up with the team in Germany so after the team had been traveling Indonesia and um, Switzerland whatever and they arrived in Hamburg I was waiting at the airport to meet them and the boys didn't know I was going to be there so that was Sort of pretty emotional, as you can imagine. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, I must admit that being part of the team, um, when when I was first told not to play again, I, I sort of accepted it pretty well straight away because I realised how lucky I was. And um, but when I was with the team in Germany, it was harder to accept yes. than when I was told, if you know what I mean. Because I'd always yeah, because, been yeah. I'd always been in the team I'd never been on the bench yeah. and you know to sit in the first team talk with Rally and he's going through everybody's roles and I thought but Rally you haven't mentioned me and I thought oh geez oh no that's why I'm not playing you know? yeah so that, that was hard so anyway that's how and, it goes but it would have been but it, it, in one way uh hard but also in another way it would have been good to support your teammates who are there to do oh. a job as well so good for them absolutely no um, and I'm sure Fantastic. they would have benefited. And, and, and can I just is... say that, that they did so well over there. Yeah. They played really well and were unlucky in the first game against uh, East Germany, who in those days, of course, was, you know, the, they were all like, you know, superhuman with the, the drugs and whatever that they were taking. The East Germany beat West Germany, of course, in the next round. We, you know, we encountered West Germany, um, you know, who went on to win it, of course, with Beckenbauer and all their superstars. And then we had, had the draw against Chile. So yeah. all in all, our, even though we didn't manage to score a goal over there, our performances were, were fantastic. And they won a lot of fans um, yeah. through their performances in Germany. And uh, I want you to talk about the camaraderie after, um, after football. A lot of you guys have, have stayed close um, and you've got those bonds of being, and that's one beautiful thing that football does. You know, the mateship, yep. the mateship of the um, of uh, being a soccerer. Talk to me about that. Well, we, um, you know, we're we're still reasonably close. You know, we we, you know, we're all spread out over the country, and but most of the guys all keep in touch pretty well. I I actually caught up with Johnny Walkers at, at the weekend. It was John's 80th on um, on Sunday, would you believe? So I managed to catch up with him on on Sunday, which was fantastic, you know, and he, he still looks as well as what he ever he ever did, you know, and some never changes. And, and Bunny, I see Bunny in Newcastle here fairly regularly and that. And the other guys you're always talking to, and especially, you know, if any of us have got a few problems, health problems or whatever, someone's always on the phone yes. inquiring about your wealth fair and you know rally rings every so often you know and he never never misses a beat rally and so it's always good to keep in touch with them and you know um even though it wasn't on last year they have a, a golf day down at um jamie warren's jamboree pub uh, for the johnny warren football foundation every year and um we go down there and play golf and quite a few of the boys turn up for that every year which is always good jimmy fraser's usually there and yeah. adrian 
um, you know, but it's, so it's always good to catch up with a few guys down there as well. That's, that's brilliant. Tell us, Ray, there's a 14, 15, 16-year-old boy or girl listening. What advice do you have for them so they get the most out of their football? Well, I've got, I've got grandkids that age, would you believe? And, and what I, I try to tell you is just to go out there and enjoy it and, you know, and just keep practising. You know, you, you, can, you can go to training one or two nights a week and the coach can show you what to do, but unless you practise, you're not going to improve. And, um, you know, but when you do get on the park, just enjoy it and have fun and, and, and make the most of it. You know, it's, um, it, it's a very simple message. I think a lot of coaching now is over-coaching. I think, um, you know, I, I'm... I know that the, the trend nowadays is to play possession football, but I think the coaches tend to overdo that where they, they encourage players to keep the ball and take the easy option more so than letting a player express themselves. And um, I, I would like to see the coaches now say, look, your first option is to go forward. If you can't go forward, then go square or then go back. But at least try to go forward and try to take the player on if you can and, mm. and, and let's create something. And I, I think we need to bring a bit of excitement back into the game to bring the fans back and, to, and get the game up where it should be in this country. Fantastic words of wisdom. Ray, thank you for your contribution to Australian football. You've served, uh, you've been a great servant of the game and you're much loved around the country. Um, it's been an absolute honour, sir, speaking to you today and we wish you all the best of health um, and uh, to you and uh, to your extended family, uh, all the best wishes. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Sash. All the best, mate. Thank you. Hey, guys. We've come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our wonderful guest. If you like this type of content and would like to see more, how about you hit the like and subscribe button and have a fantastic day.